Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm the host of the webinar today. So we are about to start the webinar in one minute. And I know that we have quite a lot of participants here today. So it would be really great if you can introduce yourselves uh, like briefly in the chat box so that we can know each other better. And I will see you in, uh, in one minute very soon. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Ingrid, and I'm the MC for today's event. So today, the webinar is about accelerating a just energy transition in Asia. And this is organized by Carbon Care InnoLab under the Jockey Club Solar Care Program. And we are very happy to announce that we have more than 100 today's webinar, uh, including people from different backgrounds and different, uh, uh, different places. And today we are also very honored to have 12 experts from all over Asia to share their views and knowledge on Asia's renewable energy development. But before they share with, share with us, I will first invite Mr. Chong Chen Yao, the co-founder and CEO of Carbon Care InnoLab to say a few words to us and also introduce us the Jockey Club Solar Care Program. I will now pass the floor to Mr. Chong. To join this uh, seminar, uh, webinar. We hope we can see you face to face. But on the other hand, with internet, we are glad to have speakers from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and in our city, Hong Kong, and from other places. So um, I would like to, on behalf of Carbon Care in the lab, to welcome you. Carbon Care InnoLab was founded in 2014 by myself and another like-minded advocate. We are about climate justice, climate justice carbon reductions, resource conservation, adaptation, and resilience building. In this time of urgencies, let me remind people of the call from the IPCC in its latest report that we are already passing through the horrible line of three degrees if we don't do anything drastic to change our way of living. And we, at the same time, are talking about this long-term crisis, which is now immediately, and also immediate crisis that facing us, the wars around the world. This is also a distraction of our effort to deal with the more fatal uh, climate crisis. So let's work hard to achieve peace and also a sustainable world. The solar program, the, the Jockey Club Solar Care Program was initiated by Carbon Care in the lab and funded by Hong Kong Jockey Club. We leverage on the fitting tariff scheme of Hong Kong, where you can generate solar electricity and sell to the power companies at three dollars four dollars or five dollars hong kong dollars per um, kph but we leverage this um, program to 
promote NGOs to participate in the schemes. So we partner with NGOs to build solar systems on their premises, making use of the fit-in tariff to support the NGOs running costs, as well as climate education programs. So in this way, we engage with um, children's homes, youth organizations, camps, and other NGOs, which might not have a direct connections with climate change education in the first place. But in this program, we engage them. So we build up a map uh, of many partners. And in this map, you can press a button to actually identify capacity of the uh, stations. So we try one, the cross row, uh, which is a uh, um, global citizenship education uh, organizations. So you can see the solar systems performing there uh, about the capacity, the electricity being generated, uh, and other informations. So this lab, this web, we intend to expand uh, with our partnership with um, Baptist University to be a community-based solar map, okay? So uh, I won't take um, too much of your time today because we have eminent speakers and we should learn from them about how to accelerate just energy transition to a low carbon economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Uh, now I will briefly go through the rundown for today's webinar. So the first session will be about recent progress of the renewable energy development in Asia. And the first session will last for about one hour. And then uh, I'll just check in, okay. And then I'll move on to the second session. The second session will focus on the challenges of an energy transition in Asia concerning social, economic, and political aspects. Uh, we can move on to the second slide. Yeah. And then after session two, we will have uh, five minutes breaks. And then uh, next we will go on to the last session, the third session. This one will focus on the future and how we can work on accelerating a just energy transition. And there will be Q and A sessions for all the three sessions. And all of you, all the participants are very welcome to type your questions in the Q and A box. And if you have any other technical, technical problems, you can also type in a chat box and our colleagues will try to help. So let's start with the first session of the webinar. For the first session, we have four speakers here with us today who will provide us some uh, analysis and insights of the recent progress in East Asia. And let me quickly introduce the four speakers. First, we have Mr. Kevin Lee, the researcher of Carbon Care in the lab. Um, Kevin has been working in, on issues concerning climate change, on water and poverty reduction for more than 20 years. And he also has experience in research, in grant making and working with partner organizations in the Asia region. And also we have another speaker, Mr. Zhao Ang, the co-founder and director of Rock Environment and Energy Institute in Beijing. Mr. Zhao has worked on energy transition policy for more than 15 years. And he has also published in various journals such as China Environment Series, International Journal of Applied Logistics, and so many others. And we also have Dr. Zhao Jiao Wei with us today, the chair of Taiwan Environment and Planning Association. Dr. Zhao is also the adjunct assistant professor of National Taiwan University, specializing in climate change and sustainable development. And he has been very actively involved in the climate and energy policy for already 15 years. And last but not least, we also have Ms. Mika Obayashi, the director of Renewable Energy Institute in Japan. So Ms. Obayashi has already been working in the energy field for 30 years. She also previously worked in Abu Dhabi for the International Renewable Energy Agency. And she is also one of the two founders of the Institute for Sustainable Energy to share with us first. Kevin will be telling us some situation in Hong Kong and compare it with other uh, Asian cities. Okay, thanks Ingrid for introduction. introduction. 
uh, I'm about to share my screen. Um, okay, so um, yeah, wait a minute. Mm. Hey, what happened? Oh, our colleagues are coming for you. Just a second. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, there are just uh, some technical issues. <laughs> okay. So uh, let me start with the. Um, well, I guess um, I guess you are so much aware of the uh, the recent uh, uh, IPCC report, which actually talks about the climate change mitigation. So I would actually I would not go into details, but I would like to give a, a bit highlights uh, from this report. Uh, so basically, this talks about you know global greenhouse gas emissions will should peak before 2025. And, and urban areas actually is contributing a large amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions actually accounts for 76 to 70, uh, 67 to 72 percent of a global share. And so, so you can see the urban the role of urban areas and then uh, without a strengthening of policies actually uh, greenhouse gas emissions will lead to, uh, will, will, will continue to rise and leading to a 3.2 degrees Celsius by 2100 and and uh, at the same time, uh, uh, from in the last decade, actually, solar energy, uh, I mean, the cost of solar energy and wind energy and batteries actually keep continually uh, decreasing. So uh, at the same time, so you can see uh, there's already a lot, lot uh, large increase of uh, deployment of these renewable energy. So with all these findings, I think uh, one of the important headlines is actually we are calling on the repeat acceleration of mitigation efforts. So uh, I think this is a very important remarks for us to start with the, all the discussions today. So for Paris Watch Report, actually we are this is a report. Uh, this is a report actually have been initiated by Kapak you know, left since 2018. We actually tracked the annual performance of Hong Kong and other Asian cities uh, with regard to the Paris Agreement goals and the climate pledges. So we, we tracked since 2018 and um, a couple of questions actually have been so much related to the energy transition, apart from uh, climate impasse and also the adaptation issues. Um, one is the energy, renewable energy and the other is about energy efficiency. So uh, what's actually going on in our cities? As because cities are in very important role, play, play an important, important role in energy transition. But in the past few years, where, when we are in our tracking report, record, um, the, the six Asian cities that we, we are looking at, including Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Seoul, Tokyo, and Shenzhen, uh, some of them actually have a slightly larger uh, share of, uh, of renewable energy. But at the same time, like Hong Kong is actually the, has the smallest share as you can see from the, uh, uh, the figure in the top left hand side. And on the uh, bottom right hand side, you can see the, the pledges as well. Of course, some uh, uh, have made a very uh, ambitious pledge of renewable energy like Tokyo. It's up to 50% of renewable energy by 2035, uh, 2030, 2030. But um, at the same time, you can see some other loss, not uh, as ambitious as Tokyo, like in, in, in Shenzhen or in in uh, Singapore, in Hong Kong, actually, they're very moderate, I mean, the, the, uh, the ambition, the targets. So, I mean, uh, for Hong Kong, uh, actually, so far has the least proportion of renewable energy, only 0.3% of electricity uh, comes from renewable energy sources. And um, of course, uh, it is uh, already made, we have made a significant progress compared with uh, three years ago, because that uh, because of the feed-in tariff scheme, which was mentioned by, uh, by Chan Yao, uh, actually, we we have a significant increase of uh, solar PV and in the rooftops of many houses from uh, starting from one megawatt to 20, 265 megawatts. Um, but of course, it's not ambitious is enough, as you can see when you compare with the with the uh, targets that we want to achieve. 
Um, renewable energy targets actually for Hong Kong government's plan from their uh, climate action plan 2050, we are looking at 7.5 to 10% in uh, 2035 and up to 15% of renewable energy, uh, renewable energy in 20, by 2050. Um, uh, but actually, we, we, as you can see, compare with the other cities and compare particularly with the, with the uh, uh, the reports and, and uh, uh, from the IPCC and compared with the Paris Agreement, actually we are still far very below, below very, uh, very low uh, compared with other cities and, uh, uh, and the pledges. So, um, and we also would like to look at actually Hong Kong. Uh, if we want to compare with the uh, energy, renewable energy potential of Hong Kong, uh, basically there's a, there's a much larger percentage than the Hong Kong government's claims. Uh, for example, for offshore wind, that actually uh, some scholars made uh, say that uh, according to research, they, we can make up up to 32% of offshore wind power and about 10 to 13% uh, for solar energy. So actually we have much uh, larger potential uh, of renewable energy in Hong Kong. So actually these are the examples that we are actually already piloting by our uh, government and by uh, and uh, offshore wind actually just next to us, uh, not to, not far away from Hong Kong, is actually located in Zhuhai. Uh, this is about a, a renewable energy. And for energy efficiency, uh, basically, uh, this is another very important sector also mentioned in the IPCC report. We have to make, uh, we actually there's a very high potential of saving energy saving in building sector and transport sector. But actually in the past two, three years, we made only very slight improvement for all the cities that we are tracking. Um, of course, at the same time, for uh, for the uh, pledges of uh, like uh, cities like Tokyo and Seoul, they actually have a very uh, detailed uh, targets for the uh, for the buildings. Uh, they even quant quantified the reduction targets and made some measures mandatory. For example, the installation of renewable energy in uh, uh, in the buildings are, should, uh, are mandated in some buildings. So, so these are good moves. But actually, we are still we still have a lot of things that we can improve in all the Asian cities, all the Asian cities. So these are the, actually the, what, what we are tracking in the past few years, and we are looking at very much more ambitious. Uh, improvement in the energy efficiency in buildings. And for the transport sector also, um, for uh, deployment of the electric vehicle in Hong Kong, although Hong Kong is leading the other cities, but at the same time, uh, it's still very low compared with, um, compared with the um, uh, traditional uh, vehicles. Of course, well, some, well, if you include uh, any, uh, like zero emission, uh, uh, if we include zero emission vehicles, hybrid, and also uh, natural gas, actually Tokyo is the highest. But at the same time, uh, we, we can see that uh, people actually are moving towards uh, electric vehicle rather than uh, staying at hybrid vehicles. So uh, 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 we can see uh, to examples like Seoul and Tokyo actually making a more aggressive step uh, in actually uh, targeting a new registration cars and also target market share of zero emission vehicles to fit up to 50%. So these are very aggressive, aggressive plans, but actually we are still far away from there. So um, for my presentation today, I think I would want to highlight two things. One is that um, there's actually much room for East Asian cities to accelerate the pace of energy transition. Um, and the second is actually, we, we although we have, uh, some of the cities actually we have made ambitious target, but at the same time we we, we need a more sensible action plan. Uh, actually, we have stimulate the growth of renewable energy and improvement energy efficiency. So I think uh, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, next, we will have Mr. Zhao Ang, who will be sharing with us on China's energy transition policy and practice. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? And uh, I'm really pleased to join this uh, webinar. And thank you, uh, CCIL, uh, inviting me to share uh, our work. So I'm from uh, Rock Environment Energy Institute. So let me share my screen. Uh, meantime, uh, I, I find the 
the, this webinar is very uh, uh, helpful for us to understand our uh, counterparts, cities, and also countries uh, to learn each other. And uh, what I want to share today uh, within the 10 minutes, uh, I'd like to uh, review the past uh, 10 to 15 years China's energy transition policy and uh, give some uh, observations based on the data and the uh, analysis. Uh, we have been working on this area for, for the past uh, 10 years. So let us see the, uh, the energy snapshot. Uh, it's about 10 years time uh, from around 10 years. Uh, uh, 2011 uh, was time when China's economy uh, gradually uh, slowing down. And uh, 2019 was the year before the pandemic. So this is an interesting uh, time window to look through what's going on in China's energy system. Uh, according to IEA, the final energy consumption increased uh, about 30% uh, in this uh, nine years time. And the modern renewable energy, uh, mainly solar and wind power and modern biomass uh, doubles. And you see the two charts, uh, you can easily see the, uh, the big difference uh, particularly when uh, three things you can, uh, you need to uh, re uh, realize how important the China's energy system changes over time. First is about the coal. The coal percentage, the share has been declining uh, very significantly uh, from almost uh, uh, three fourths to uh, two thirds. Second point is about the other major type of the fossil fuel, the oil. The oil increased a lot, and now more than 70% oil uh, consumed by China is uh, from uh, Im import from other countries. Uh, third is about the, the renewables. You see the wind and the solar and uh, hydropower uh, has been playing a very important role uh, in the recent time. But China's energy transition policy is ba uh, based on uh, uh, quite a few uh, uh, systematic factors from uh, industrialization, uh, economic growth, uh, climate policy, and also the environmental uh, uh, policy. Uh, you know, when China talk about the energy transition, of course, the top priority is about to uh, support economic uh, growth continually. But uh, you see, uh, in the recent years, we have been talking about how China can secure the carbon neutral uh, by 2060, and uh, uh, how that pathway could be affordable and how much investment will be uh, put there to support that. So this is a, a, a chart from the Climate Action Checker. Uh, you can see the uh, carbon emission, uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, trend. Uh, it's very challenging for China to uh, make the, the carbon neutral within uh, 30 uh, to uh, 30 to 40 years. But I will give more time to explain how the China policy, uh, energy policy have a role in the, the economic uh, shift. Uh, the, in the history of the energy policy, we mainly uh, focus on the 2005 renewable energy law. It was a foundation for China to uh, pursue the uh, renewable energy transition. And since then, China has reduced the intensity of GDP in large scale. Uh, in the recent time, particularly after 2016, uh, China has been put a lot of resources in the uh, decarbonization of the transport sector, particularly road transport sector. And when we talk about energy transition policy, we have to put the context uh, in our consideration. Uh, firstly, about energy security. Particularly when China still consume uh, the oil uh, in a very big scale year after year, China has ha had start to focus on the oil cap project, how to reduce the dependence on the oil impo import from uh, abroad. And secondly, the industrial policy always play a big role in supporting China's uh, industrialization in many factors. Thirdly, as I mentioned about air pollution, air pollution is a big issue in, in the uh, eastern part, particularly the metropolitan areas. So this is also a big concern. Uh, the coal facing out, the coal reduction uh, has been a very uh, important contributor to 
improved air quality. Uh, the fourth one is about the international climate governance. So this is a big thing, you know. Uh, China has been using this as a big leverage to improve its uh, international profile and also as an important leverage to build up the, the collaboration with the European Union and the uh, US. Lastly, I think I want to put the Climate Club at Aristo Top as an interesting uh, perspective for us to understand how China uh, is making a uh, move and also facing challenges. I will give a little bit more information later on. So the energy transition is difficult, uh, uh, that's uh, no doubt, but uh, it's still achievable. So we see the, the model from 1980 to 2020, uh, I li list some uh, information about there from the demographic div uh, dividend and to the government investment driven policy, uh, driven growth. But from now to 2060, the energy transition required China's development model shifted to more quality and a more uh, inclusive uh, policy uh, making and uh, economic growth. So I, I will not go into details, but I want to just show how we uh, divide the two models development. Although we have, have China has achieved the first 40 years economic booming, but in the next 40 years and the four decades, China is uh, uh, very uncertain uh, to uh, secure this uh, uh, transformation economically and also energy perspective. And uh, according to research from the Tsinghua University, there is a, a scenario analysis about the China's uh, transition investment. Uh, it tells uh, China needs a huge amount of the money to transform its energy system. But uh, I want to put this into uh, a research by McKinsey Global Institute. Although a lot of investment need to into the green energy, but additionally thinking, additionally, it only needs 10% uh, uh, apart from what we have to invest in supporting uh, economic development. So that means that it's not like we need to spend 275 trillion US dollar. We actually need to uh, spend extra more, only 9 trillion US dollar to make the transition in the global scale. And this is China's situation. China uh, has been heavily investing in the energy system in the past 10 years. And, uh, and last, uh, the past experience can tell uh, China has to build up more uh, resources and the energy uh, investment into the transition uh, pathway. So this is a graph picture to tell how the gap exists uh, on, until next 30 to 40 years the percentage of energy investment need to double at least. So a new initiative is a new thing under the uh, carbon neutral uh, strategy. And the government is still using its uh, uh, capacity and author uh, authority to lay out how China can achieve that uh, goal in the long term. But it's still in the, lay it's still in the uh, process of uh, disclosing the more detailed policies but those uh, measures like from renewable to secu circular economy to green industry, they are uh, major pillars of this uh, strategy. Okay, let me conclude. Um, I think China is facing a very uh, challenging situation uh, in the current era. Firstly, uh, energy security is a big issue, particularly under the, the new uh, the war in Europe and the tra energy transition under the uh, economic downturn has become a very big uh, uh, pressure. Uh, we, we all saw the uh, power outrage in uh, last year in, in big uh, parts of China. So uh, also the challenge of uh, globalization has been uh, very clear. Deglobalization has become very uh, influential. Lastly, I want to say China has to play a big role in international climate governance but uh, it's still, uh, <laughs> there are some uncertainty about, about that area because uh, what in, what, at the end of the day, the country has to put the, uh, the um, domestic um, policy and economic growth as its own priority, uh, making balance uh, in those two ends has been a very uh, difficult situation, particularly for China as number one, the carbon emission emitter around the world. 
So uh, for, lastly, I think the climate competition is a big issue. Uh, the, the OECD countries and the European and the US and also Japan and others, they are building up a, a very powerful uh, network uh, to uh, increase their commitment, I think, year after year. Uh, China will feel the pressure and then the, uh, the uh, high peer pressure to do more. I think that is a good issue, a good thing for the global uh, climate um, uh, mitigation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhao, for sharing your thoughts and insights on China. Uh, just a quick reminder for the participants, you can type your questions in the Q&A box and later in the Q&A session, I will read it out to, uh, to the, the speakers here. And next, we will have Dr. Zhao Jiawei. He will tell us about the situation in Taiwan. Hello everyone, thanks for the CCI for inviting me to share about the status and the outlook about the energy transition in Taiwan. Especially uh, this time, I will say it's quite an exciting time for the older climate advocates in Taiwan right now because the last week, the government just, uh, just announced the next zero, uh, next zero roadmap and the next and the strategy uh, for, the, for Taiwan for the next 28 years. So we, so I will also elaborate about this issue about the, the content of those uh, roadmap and the, it's uh, the place that we can uh, looking looking uh, we can look for we can watch we can watch for uh, for uh, in this uh, in my presentation. So first, I will just give you a status about the renewable development in Taiwan. Like uh, here in this figure, you can see that uh, uh, in past uh, six year. The overall energy transition policy was start in 2016. So you can see that after uh, six years for the implementation, but the share of the renewable energy only increased about around 1.2%. It was only account for the 6% uh, in, uh, by year 2021. And also at the same time, the, the share of the coal was only, uh, diminished, uh, only diminished by 1%. The, the, Total generation from the coal coal fire power, uh, basically it it was increased due to the the uh, dramatic increase of the overall power uh, power, uh, power consumption power power consumption due to the uh, rapid growth of the ele electronic industry. So compared to our, the target of the twenty twenty five of our energy trans transition target, is you can see that there's a there's still a huge gap. Between the renewable share, we have to uh, uh, we have to enhance the the share of the renewable from six percent to twenty percent or by by next four years, and uh, so then we can then we can try to lower the share of the coal fire power plant from the forty four percent to the twenty seven percent, and to reach to phase out the all the nuclear power operation in Tai in Taiwan by year twenty twenty five. So so basically so. Uh, because there's kind of like a huge gap between the status and our target. So the government was a lot, they even talk about maybe there's possibility the share of the renewable can only reach by around 50%. If, that, if they can only reach up around 50%, so the share of the coal cannot be uh, reduced to the 27%. It maybe only can re reduce to the 33%. So it will hinder the progress of our carbon reduction. If we look into the, the renewable development, you can see uh, the uh, in past, in past uh, 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 six years, the, sheer, uh, the total power generation from the, from the PV, from the solar energy was increased by nine, by nine fold. So, and the button in the opposite, the, uh, the wind power, uh, the wind power, the power generation from the wind power only increased about the, about 50 percent. So if we look into the target for the year 2025, you can see that we still need to increase increase the PV PV PV, uh, PV development by three times. We, we need a we need a trouble we need a, we need a triple installment of the PV energy. And also uh, for the for the for the offshore wind energy, we need to uh, make sure that all the offshore 
of shore energy, which was in the uh, in the construction process. Right now, they can be online. They can connect connect to the grid on on time. So then can, there's a possibility we can reach the uh, we can reach the our renewable energy development target. But due, during the experience of of past six years, we find out that uh, we have some positive uh, progress, such as we create uh, job opportunities for in the renewable energy sector. Like we increase around a three thousand uh, job job opportunity for the PV and the and the offshore and the older uh, financial sector. They are waiting to have the ESG fund to investment in the older renewable energy sectors and also for the uh, of joint wind development, we are kind of like a uh, uh, important manufacturing and the installation hub in Asia right now. But uh, I will highlight that uh, doing this process, we find out that actually the uh, public trust of the uh, pu and the public confidence of the renewable was getting lower. Uh, around uh, the support, the support of the renewable energy development was uh, diminished from the ninety-two percent. To the seventy-five percent in past five years. That's due to the some new limb issue because some are thinking uh view the uh uh PV experiment kind of like uh, they will create some uh, uh some potential harm due to due to ecological sensitivity uh, habitat and also it create some uh, uh some uh avoiding as acceptance due to the landscape issue. So this create a new limb issue. And the, the, the last one is that only uh, around less than 1% of the existing uh, renewable uh, installation are belong to the belong to the uh, citizen centric uh, citizen power uh, uh, community energy projects so it's not a uh, citizen oriented uh, energy transition uh, we are doing doing right now in taiwan uh, and but the, the last week uh, the government announced the net zero roadmap, roadmap and the strategy among its roadmap, you can see that they highlight there's a four, uh, four kind of uh, four transition that we are looking for. Uh, the first transition I mentioned is about the energy transition, industry transformation, and the sustainable lifestyle and the societal transformation, which was include the public participation and the just transition issue. And then they also highlight that we need to accelerate the two fundamentals to reach uh, to make those transition happen. Which is the two fundamental are the cities are climate uh, legalization and also the uh, research and the development and the deployment. And then in their in that in their roadmap, they also highlight some key uh, a policy milestone, such as uh, the we will ban the older IC uh, the older IC older internal uh, internal combustion engine vehicles by year 2040, and uh, oh uh, we will mandatory the uh, the net zero emission building for the public building by year 20 by year 20, 20, 2030 and also uh, we will have the fully development of the smart meter by year by year 2035 but uh, the most important thing is that uh, the government also proposed a, a huge budget which was uh, around around 900 billion billion uh, new taiwan dollars new taiwan dollars for next nine years so it will translate around Around a, a, a thirty, around thirty billion, uh, thir three billion U.S. dollars per per year per year during the next uh during during the next ten next nine years. So it will come from the the very first time Taiwan can get we call the, the climate budget. But in that roadmap, we can see that the share of the renewable will uh need to, to increase from between the ninety uh, six uh, sixty percent to the seventy percent. And the, the other part will, uh, will come with the hydrogen fired and also the LNG with the CCS. Uh, we think uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of target for the renewable, uh, renewable energy is quite, uh, it's not ambitious enough because uh, it's so it uh, this Taiwan needs, needs to rely on the LNG and LNG with CCS. So if we look into the renewable target in large net zero roadmap, we find out that the government did not propose a uh, emission target for the uh, for the solar solar energy, uh, but the, for the uh, for the wind power for the uh, especially for the offshore wind, they are willing to set out a target even uh, higher than the uh, the, the 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 proposal than the research from the 
from the NG, from the NGO. So the main issue of that is that uh, because uh, the government uh, uh, they are still really con to find out a way to maximize the maximize the uh, rooftop PV potential and also the consideration of the other renewable energy like like the geothermal and the ocean and the tidal energy and the, or the biomass is not strong en enough. And also we find out interesting things that the government did not count out a cost estimation for that uh, the real roadmap. So it hindered the public confidence about, about uh, this roadmap. So also, so there's some policy mix we need to, to accelerate the energy transition to reach the net zero for Taiwan. The first thing is that if we want to uh, deal with the issue for the renewable energy development, especially for the, uh, for the PV, we needed to uh, combine with the, with the non-name pro process, the name, pro name, name planning process and the, and the renewable, uh, renewable, renewable energy siting so we can uh, avoid the dis distribute between, uh, with uh, about the ecological sensitivity and also also the social accept can also can enhance the social acceptance. Also, another thing I would like to highlight is the demand side solution in that room is not uh, uh, is not addressed en enough. So they did not come out uh, aggressive energy energy efficiency target in that room. And also, we need uh, to a uh, strong carbon price pricing to uh, make the polluter pay and to uh, adjust the over the overall energy energy price, so it can create a more incentive for the renewable energy development. The last one is that we will say uh, in the meantime uh, we cannot see the the role of the citizen in our uh, next year roadmap. This is also a place we need to highlight, and the, the other NGO will will focus on, on this, this issue to make uh, this, uh, the overall the data zero roadmap implementation process can be more inclusive. inclusive. So that's my, uh, that's my sharing, uh, that's my perspective. Thanks for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhao. It's really great to hear the very latest news and roadmap from Taiwan. And let's also hear from Ms. Mika Obayashi. Just now I heard from Kevin saying that Tokyo is more ambitious in uh, using renewable energy comparing with other cities. Maybe you can tell us more about that. Okay, thank you very much for Ingrid for the introduction. That it's my really honor to be uh, one of the speaker um, at this uh, panel and then hearing the, uh, the other countries and then other experts at the initiative that in the energy transition. I just would like to explain that about the advancing green energy transition in Japan, that, that what is a kind of a status and then also that, that our uh, challenges that we are facing. Uh, Kevin already explained about the global energy transition, but I just tried to recall that the slide tree about the, what is happening globally. So this is a kind of a global solar installation. According to the pr prediction by BNEF uh, made by last year, like a global uh, solar power expansion really surged that uh, it has installed that the one, 193 gigawatt were installed at the last year. So the, it's nearly reaching that the 900 gigawatt, of course, but this is a, a tentative uh, numbers. So maybe that we have to check it after the two, two, two months or something like that when the global statistics will be available, but that this is a status. And then this is because that, uh, as you might know, that the cost of the PV solar is declining so fast. And that this is the status of global wind power uh, capacity. It was already that uh, uh, announced by the Global Wind Energy Council. So I think that, that this could be, uh, I, I can say that this is the one of the fixed number so the uh, last year, at the end of last year, like uh, 837 gigawatt, 837 gigawatt of uh, wind power were installed. And then at, this um, at the same time that the still the uh, wind power has decreasing its cost. It's a kind of a comparison of solar photovoltaic and a centralized that the solar power onshore and offshore wind. So it is becoming cheaper than the uh, all electricity. Uh, sources. And then renewable are now the cheapest new electricity in countries making up just under the four third of world GDP. So you could see like uh, in many countries, renewable becomes the cheapest new energy sources. 
And then according to this statistics that the uh, ending trend, renewable could decarbonize 90% of the power sector by 2050. This is the new study released by IRENA uh, like uh, two, two weeks ago or something, that the renewable will provide 65% of the total electricity supply by 2030, and then respectively from over 25 in 2018. So it is just becoming double and double. Uh, in, in past years, and then we, we have to make it double again that in uh, by 2030. And that uh, this is a kind of our the promise that uh, we are reaching. So uh, according to the other, uh, uh, many countries, a new target for renewables, uh, for example, uh, EU has a 54, 55. 55 means that 55 de deduction of carbon uh, emissions by 2030. And if we try to reach this target that the EU said, like uh, EU countries has to increase the renewable in the electricity mix about 65%. And uh, um, the last year that the Germany selected the new cabinet, new, new government and the new cabinet, new cabinet that the once uh, proposed like 80% uh, of renewables by 2030, but now, under these very difficult circumstances in Europe that uh, they have the new target, like a, uh, almost 100% of renewables by 2035. I think it's a really ambitious and then kind of a very, how can I say, the positive response to this very difficult situation. So the, all the countries that in Europe that has the uh, kind of a larger target by 2030, and then some countries are aiming for 100% of renewables. And in the US, they don't have the kind of a um, national base a target, but some cities, some, some states are quite advanced. Like California, New York has a 60%, 70% by 2030. And then 2050, and even before 2050, that they would like to reach 100% of renewables 2045. And then in Japan, that you can see, like uh, um, Japanese government has a new uh, basic energy plan last year that aims 36% to 38% of renewables by 2030. So it's a, about the half of other countries target. So we think that we have to increase this and then have that more ambitious target. And I think that the uh, point that we have to check is the coal-fired power plant. You could see like uh, at the end of the right uh, table, the uh, other countries that targeted like uh, zero uh, coal-fired power after 2035 or by 2050, that of course that they don't have any um, any uh, coal-fired power plant. But even uh, but but for Japan, that uh, we have the uh, 19 percent, one nine percent of coal-fired power plant in 2030. This is a kind of official figure by the uh, Japanese government. If we if I compare the current status of Japan that with other countries, you could see that the Japan's uh, renewable is still a uh, little bit lagging behind compared to other countries. I have to say, um, but but uh, uh, I have to say like Japan has increased the uh, renewable energy percentage double in past decade, but still the pace is slow. Um, so the, um, it is a speed of expansion in other countries that are really rapid that because of the cost reduction, uh, we have to make it that the more accelerated space that in, uh, pace in Japan. And that this is a kind of a calculation of solar and uh, wind installation. It, it's not the latest number. I have to say it's the end of 2020. So the one year ago number. But uh, Japan has reached that uh, almost 70 gigawatt of PV installation by the end of 2020. So I, I assume that it will over uh, the, uh, 70 gigawatt already now. But if, if you can see that the wind installation is quite minimum. And uh, we think that the reason for this uh, slow space for wind installation that it's of course that it's mainly about the onshore wind installation. That is the kind of a policy gap uh, of the government and the speed of the uh, industry development has occurred in Japan. And also 
like uh, for the wind power installation, it's very in, in important to provide uh, um, the flexibility for the grid, um, grid situation. But uh, in Japan, the uh, power sector restructuring has totally delayed and uh, like, uh, you know, that even the five years ago, we had the vertically integrated regional monopolized that the incumbent utilities and they own the transmission system and then power plants as well. So it was very difficult for renewables to get into the grid. So th this trend is still uh, um, continues that in Japan. So I would like to see where Japan's greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. So the half of Japan's GHGs are coming from the 130 facilities and offices. So the, and then, and then this half is what is like a thermal power is about one third of Japanese emissions. And then factory basis about that 20% of Japan's total emissions. And then top 10 emitters, you can see the coal-fired power plant and the steel industry. So we have to make the energy transition in those sectors. But uh, actually, Japanese government uh, is now saying that Asia is uh, one of the decarbonized that, uh, CO2 area. And then Japan tried to help Asian countries to have the combating existing summer power generation into zero emission power generation in a necessary path. This is a kind of a, a, um, announcement announcement made by Prime Minister Kishida at the COP26 last year. And then what does this mean? That this is a kind of a Japan tried to export the uh, gas turbine or coal fire power plant still with the technology of CCS. And then uh, there, uh, the Asian countries will produce that the uh, high hydrogen and uh, ammonia, and then those products uh, will be imported to Japan. That is a kind of a, the concept of the Japanese government. And 2030, that as I said, that they still have 36 to 38 percent. But our assessment that Japan can reach like more than 45 percent of renewables by 2030. And then this is quite necessary because we have to make sure carbon neutrality by 2050. So the energy transition has to be made by 2030. Okay, what is the problem? People say like a land constraints, Japan doesn't have enough land, but according to our assessment and calculations that we could have more and more renewables, especially the solar power, because it could be a cheapest energy source, like a kind of abundant farm run, or maybe that on the rooftop scale. I just saw that kind of a question in the uh, discussion of uh, this panel. Uh, there is a constraints of the land because of the uh, so total dense dense area, like a cities of Tokyo or something like that. But and then um, and then um, that, that she said that she came from that San Francisco. I understand that California has the regulation for the new buildings uh, has to ha has to install the solar power on the rooftop. And then Tokyo Metropolitan Government is also talking about that. So the regulation for the rooftop solar could be utilized like for the dense area, like a city center, urban area. Um, and then also cost constraints that people say, like uh, in, in Japan that the renewable is very expensive because of land is limited or something like that. But you could see that the, the Republic of Korea, it's also that the land constraints and then not so much favor for the PV solar and the UK. It's favor for offshore wind, but not so favor for the PV solar. But you can say that the cost declining in those two countries, I think that it's quite similar countries like Japan, um, the more than 90%, the, this trend is according to, I, I mean that the totally accord to the global trend, 90% reduction of cost solar power. So the Japan's cost reduction pace is still very strong. And you could see that Japan is the second uh, most expensive uh, country in the world. And then especially the inverter and the mechanical installation, electrical installation, those kind of the construction fee is quite expensive in Japan. So I think I see that this is a, one of the barriers. And then what another thing that what we need, we need a flexibility in the grid. 
So the Japan can be counted as like a Sweden, Finland, Belgium, uh, Denmark, Norway, and Germany or something like that because the Japan has that huge demand in its own country. So maybe that we could have that smooth connection of each power sector area in, within Japan. And maybe in future, we need a kind of interconnector with other countries like South Korea and China. It could be useful. And especially that we have the huge potential of offshore wind and offshore wind will be um, constructed on the sea. And then maybe that we can have the interconnector from Korea and then Japan and then offshore wind could be viable that to provide electricity to the, those connectors. So what is needed? Um, I think that uh, we need the flexibility and the renewable energy cost down is must for having the best uh, amount of renewables that in Japan. Fitting out coal by 2030, increase renewable around 50%, ambitious 2030, 2050 targets, increase flexibility on of the grid structure and operation and take out artificial market barriers and make the market more efficient for renewables, meaningful carbon pricing system, tax for global warming countermeasures that we already have is very small minimum amount of carbon pricing for fossil fuel. So maybe that we have to have useful carbon pricing system in Japan to make the renewable really uh, cost competitive with existing coal. Stop financing fossil nationally and internationally. This is quite important. And uh, at the same time, like uh, this kind of installing, installing that the carbon pricing globally uh, uh, in Japan is a must. It would accelerate energy transition with making lower the cost of renewables than existing coal fired power plant. And it is also essential to strengthen Japan's domestic power grid and in the medium to long term to look at international power transmission with interconnections Asia. And then the potential um, and in practice, the um, and then Asia, including Japan, is lit in renewable energy resources and by promoting an energy transition based on energy saving, efficiency, and renewables, we can realize economic development, prosperity, and peace in Asia. One country may be able to achieve an energy transition, but one country cannot build peace. Decarbonization and energy transition are necessary and sufficient conditions for people to live safe and happily. Thank you very much for hearing about my presentation. Thank you very much, Mika. And uh, let's proceed to a short Q&A session now. And you can type your questions in the Q&A box. And just now, actually, I already received some questions in the box. And I know that some of the speakers have already replied by text. But I think it's more like it's more great to to, uh, to also discuss it publicly here. And just now I saw that there are questions concerning about the situation in Hong Kong. Maybe Kevin can tell us more about that. I saw that uh, people asking about the level of climate education in the city and also like the, how is the social environment affecting the, the, the renewable energy transition? Can you like maybe briefly tell us about the situation here? Okay, so um, basically um, the question about climate education, I guess I will not touch it uh, so much here because it's actually, it will be another big, very big topic. So so I, I actually quite prefer to uh, treat this uh, hand in hand separately, but actually it's another question about uh, renewable energy in Hong Kong. Some people will say, oh, uh, Hong Kong people are quite practical and, and, and return sensitive. So um, it's not really favoring uh, renewable energy, but I guess renewable energy is already in the government's action plan, climate action plan. So actually we have, I mean, the government has to fulfill their pledges. Um, uh, actually what, what we are, what we are uh, concerning is not about uh, the government or the power sector is not investing in renewable energy. It's, it's that the problem is that actually the, the, the targets that they, that they set is not ambitious enough and with with the with the potential that the uh, researchers have been finding actually in the past few years actually they have uh, we we have we actually have a lot of potential but indeed um people because of uh, many different reasons because of course because of uh, technical reasons they think that they it might it might that they can they can't really look for ambitious uh, renewable energy development so so i think i think we have to look at how much we can 
uh, I mean, how Hong Kong can, how much can deliver uh, uh, the renewable energy development? Because, because with that, with that, all the potential, actually, we have the all kinds of criteria, all kinds of conditions to, to fulfill the pledges. So, so the main call for us actually is to update and to raise the renewable energy tar target instead of saying Hong Kong stop saying uh, stopping at the stage just keeping keep saying Hong Kong is too practical to to renewable energy. I think this is my short answer to this. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And I also received some questions from Mika from uh, Clement Lung, uh, saying that it's well known that floating PV systems have been quite proper in Japan. What do you think that such FPV systems will be further developed and expanded to meet part of the RE initiatives? And also, uh, he also asked in addition to offshore wind farms, would offshore FPV farms also contribute more in the global RE targets? Okay, thank you very much um, for the, claim, uh, the, the comments for the uh, question about the floating solar. Yes, that in Japan, that some places that we have the floating solar. It is, um, uh, you can say that Japan is a top country to install that floating solar, but, but it means like uh, other countries are a little bit lagging behind to install that uh, floating solar, I have to say. Um, uh, in Japan, um, there could be there some places that we can install like a kind of a dam or the uh, kind of agricultural pond or something like that. And then we estimate like uh, it could be installed um, about, uh, we had a calculation before, um, it's about like, yeah, uh, by, by 2030, it will be the, um, but, but it's not so major. Uh, com compared to the um, uh, devastated agricultural land or something like that. But, but, but still, there could be a potential of the floating solar here in Japan. Yeah, it's true. And then, that any other questions that you said, like Ingrid? Uh, let me see. She, uh, he also asked about the offshore wind farms. Uh, offshore wind farms. I think that all the kind of speakers already I mentioned about offshore wind farms, but uh, for Japan that we have the huge uh, target of offshore wind. Um, it is like a kind of a, a 10, 10 gigawatt by 2030 and then 30 to 45 gigawatt by 2040. But this is only the kind of a, a pipeline basis. So the uh, in reality, the start operation of 5.7 gigawatt by 2030, because it's almost none in Japan. And the uh, government is saying like 45 gigawatt or planning by 2040. But I think that, that that's the very minimum target that we have to accelerate that offshore wind like uh, about uh, 60 gigawatt by 2050. Otherwise, like uh, we cannot reach 100% renewables. Thank you, Mika. And I also received uh, questions for all speakers, and we will extend the Q&A session by like five minutes. Um, someone asking that, can the speakers also share your views on the development status of CCS and green hydrogen in Asia? Will these technologies be timely and cheap enough to make meaningful contribution to the plant transition? See who would want to answer the question. Can I start the question? Can yeah, I sure, sure, sure. Yeah, about the CCS, the Japan is totally that focusing on to develop the CCS. And uh, it, globally, CCS has been all, already invested a lot, but it's not for the uh, thermal power plant, that it is uh, for the oil and gas digging places. So the uh, with the thermal power plant, there is only one that the CCS plant that in Canada is viable. So I think that, that this uh, technology of CCS with summer power plant is not mature yet in the in globally, I have to say. And then green hydrogen is also the question. I think that we have to make clear the definition of the green hydrogen, that even Japan saying like a kind of a CCS type of gas could be a green hydrogen or something like that. Hydrogen has to, is not the primary energy source, but maybe so. So we have to uh, make clear that uh, what kind of energy source that hydrogen will be produced. And then actually, that I didn't say uh, clearly, but uh, we need a kind of a tracking system globally, and then also carbon pricing system globally to track 
that uh, which uh, energy sources and then energy products are uh, um, trading in Japan, uh, in, in the world to see that uh, what is a green and what is gray or something like that. And then this technology is quite still quite expensive. So maybe that we have to make it to use it at the very difficult decarbonized area, like a heavy duty transport or heavy industry, you think, but not for power sector. Thank you, Mika. And I also uh, found another question for all of the speakers from Taiwan. And then uh, the question is about how climate litigation affects your country's uh, climate policy. See, uh, anyone would like to answer this question as well. Sorry, can you see the question again, Ingrid? Oh, oh he asked uh, how climate litigation affects your country's climate policies. So um, let me try. Uh, before I just give a quick uh, response about the CCS and the green hydrogen, I, I personally think the in terms of the uh, economics uh, analysis, I think the CCS and the green hydrogen, mainly hydrogen production from renewables, may have a role in in the future, and particularly when the uh, big scale implementation demonstration become more mature. I think for many uh, countries uh, from European countries like Germany to Asian countries like Japan, China, and South Korea, they do need this uh, to support their uh, high percentage of the second uh, sector. For the uh, climate litigation, I think China is still in the process of making the climate uh, as, as a law. And I know uh, there are still very few number of countries in the world to uh, legalize the climate in commitment in their law system, but China, China is not there. Uh, but China used there a lot of the command and control policy measures to uh, to do this kind of thing. So uh, I think uh, uh, different countries based on the different political system may have uh, quite uh, various uh, measures to, to address the climate governance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhao. Uh, see if there are any other answers. Okay, Dr. Zhao, please. Uh, I, I just mentioned, I will just elaborate about the CCS and the hydrogen question because in, in our existing the next year roadmap of time proposed by the Taiwan's government, they uh, they put a, a lot of emphasis on, on that, but they are doing that in the wrong way. Like they, they want to use in the hydrogen fires, power plant, and also have a more than 20% of the CCS which was, uh, I think it's a little bit wasteful to use those variable resources for, for that. And, uh, but, but in Taiwan, actually we heard a lot, a lot of renewable uh, hydrogen development is come from the, like some uh, offshore, offshore wind company. They are trying to do that uh, to, com to have a, a combined project to have the offshore wind, just uh, offshore wind to produce hydrogen and to use that hydrogen for the uh, energy intensive uh, industry like the steel and the petrochemical industries. So there's kind of like, uh, in the meantime, we still trying to push for the government to have a national hydrogen strategy to have a, a more comprehensive uh, conceivable cons plan to, for, the, for the hydrogen development. Or, or, if, if, or you, can, uh, you can see that under existing strategy, they were just using the the wrong way to they just will use the wrong wrong application for the hydrogen. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Chow. I think that's pretty much for the first session. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chow, uh, Mika, also Mr. Chow and Kevin for your sharing and insights today. Now we'll move on to the next session now.